Welcome, everyone. We're so glad to have all of you joining us today. I hope you can see our screen. Um, this is our first in a series of one-hour clinical webinars designed to help you improve your camera outcome. This is Natalie King. I am the Director of Training for AccuFocus. And given the number of attendees, it seems like we have a lot of camera partners that are interested in optimizing their patient selection for camera inlay. Uh, we have two great speakers today that will help guide us on our topic, identifying the best camera inlay patients. Now, if you, um, for those of you who are listening on the call, just want to let you know the webinar is being recorded. And we've got a few other housekeeping tips that I'm going to cover with you before we get started. The recording will be available shortly after this call, and it will also be available for those unable to join us today. So we'll send you that link within the next week or so. So number two, I just want to remind you, we're really excited to announce the next in the series of clinical webinars, Normal and Abnormal Findings During Post-Op Recovery. So our guest speakers on this web, that webinar will share with you some about the importance of key post-op assessments, what's normal and really what's not normal at some of these visits, and how to educate those patients on visual recovery and expectations for post-op milestones. Um, it's a great topic for our follow-up to this call today. So I can't tell you how many times when I'm in the field, um, people ask me, well, what's normal and what's not normal with these patients? I don't know what to tell them. So it's a topic you definitely don't want to miss. We will be emailing invitations to this event within the next two weeks. So watch your inbox and make sure to spec check your spam folder as well. As you know, you're all muted today, except for the presenters. But we want to hear from you because we want to address all your questions at the end of the webinar. So um, I invite you to send us your questions using the chat feature. Now, the icon is found on the very top of the Join Me navigation bar, and we circled it red here on the screen. So please select the, select the chat icon. And then when you click it, there's a little arrow to the left of where it says, at all. Choose at education. If you click on that, it brings at education. And please, please send your questions to at education. That way we will receive them here and they won't go to everybody on the call. Um, so we really want to hear from you. So as you think of questions, go ahead and answer them and we'll collect them and answer them at the end of the call. So before I introduce our speakers, I just want to advise you that the comments made by our speakers are not necessarily those of AccuFocus. And I'm really excited, finally, to introduce our two great speakers for today from Clear Choice Custom LASIK in Cleveland, Ohio. We have Dr. Jeff Augustine. He's the Director of Clinical Operations there, and his practice has been offering the camera inlay to patients for a little over a year and they've quickly become one of the country's top camera inlay implanters. So welcome, Jeff. And Thank Brenda you. is a clinical consultant who's been involved with the camera inlay since 2006. She worked at one of the US FDA clinical study sites, and they've implanted over 100 inlays, and that's where she's gained her vast experience with camera patients, both, both pre-op and post-operatively. So thanks to both of you for joining us. They're going to share their patient selection secrets with us today. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. Uh, and Brenda, take it away, Jeff. All right. Well, um, I want to thank, thank everybody for having me on board with this program. It's been an exciting uh, paradigm shift in refractive surgery for me uh, since I've been in this industry and in this profession since the early 90s. And so to see the big excitement come this year in ophthalmology in regards to, you know, the new approvals with all the new inlays, the, the approval with cross-linking this year, and the approval with smile vision this year has brought uh, great excitement to this field. And it's going to brought a, a big energy and big change to our menu in regards to you know, where, how we're going to look at things now. You know, before it was uh, 
it was pretty uh, easy to, you know, consult the patient in regards to their refractive surgery options. But now the menu has changed dramatically. So what we're going to do is we're going to start out with this first case. And a lot of a lot of you guys that may be on today may not be familiar with some of the terms that we present with this because you may be early in the stages of your journey down the camera road. Uh, but this case here is just a simple uh, cursory, uh, quick outline on some uh, a few points. But uh, of course, it doesn't have all the points that go into decision making when it comes to you know the camera decisions. So we, we see this 48-year-old uh, male come in. He's really frustrated because you know he has having difficulty with his disability of presbyopia, and he's having trouble with his smartphone and and the, the wearing his glasses are really inhibiting his life. So a couple parameters that we're going to look at, uh, if you go back, uh, a couple parameters that we look at is corneal thickness. Certainly that's a big uh, factor. We evaluate whether, you know, what his dominant eye is. And then we look at objective scatter index. And later in the lecture, we'll go into more detail as to what objective scatter index means. But at 1.9 and a complaint of watery eyes, and a, and a mesopic uh, pupil size. You know, what, what, are we, what are some of the trends that we're thinking about here, Brenda? Um, Jeff, that's a great question. You know, when we look at this, um, the OSI, as we're all familiar or getting familiar, familiar with the AccuTarget HD, that, uh, which is a great tool, um, but the OSI really is an objective scatter index, which gives us a lot of information. And so it really tells us about the patient's quality of vision and um, gives us clues as to whether this patient might be a good candidate to do this type of surgery or if there's something else we should be looking for. So with an objective scatter index for this patient of 1.9, um, things that you would want to look at um, would be, you know, what is it that's making his index that number. Um, ideally, we like them to be under 1. 1.9 is not terrible. It's kind of in the, in the um, borderline stage there. But you want to look for other pathologies, such as cataracts, dry eye, things that, like that, especially with the history of watery eyes. Um, you'll want to definitely look at that and do a thorough evaluation. But that's the thing that stands out the most with this case. Um, corneal thickness is perfectly normal. Pupil size is normal as well. But with this guy, you really want to explore that a little bit more. I can't agree more. Um, let's, you know, as far as, you know, my thoughts on that, I, mine are identical to Brenda. And when we look at the objective scatter index, we're looking at what does the, you know, what, what does that, what does that objective scatter index indicate? Well, it can indicate a, cor a corneal issue uh, in regards to the tear layer and tear film integrity. And it can also look at the uh, what the, what the lens appears as because it, it gives us a basically a wavefront view from the cornea back to the retina, and and with the inlays it's paramount that we have pure optics in order for this to be a successful case. So when that index is high, we have to go and explore the reasons why, so that we don't uh, inadvertently. Uh, have this patient undergo uh, an implantation. Next slide. Now, patient selection for the camera inlay is paramount, especially when you're you're embarking on this early surgical procedure. Because certain, I have gone down uh, when I first started working with the camera inlay. We did our first 20 cases, and I hadn't selected and maybe made some decision making that wasn't proper for the patient selection so I can optimize my outcome. So that's what the point of this, of this lecture is, so that when we start with this, we really have to be selective in order for us to have great outcomes, in, in, in order for us to enjoy this as a clinician, but also our patients to have, enjoy it as well as their outcome. So this is my day. We have a beautiful October day in Cleveland. This is the practice that I'm at. Uh, located in Brecksville, Ohio, which is about the midway point between Cleveland and Akron. Uh, the center is broken up into three, this campus, I campus is broken up into three different sections. Uh, there's the LASIK section or the laser center that is all corneal related. Uh, there's also another uh, a door for primary care. We have an ASC there and we have a pediatric center there. 
my day really involved all surgical um, refractive procedures from PRK, LASIK, ICL, cross-linking, intact, clear lens extraction, and now corneal inlay. So it gives you kind of a background of, of what's, what, what I do. Uh, everybody understands presbyopia, but we really have to convey in a basic terms what presbyopia means to the patient. Now they have to have a, we have to convey a clear understanding of the mechanics behind presbyopia, but we still don't know uh, the, the, you know, the, the etiologies. You know, it may be loss of capsule elasticity. You know, we, we have zonular fiber function issues. We have changes in the, the anatomy of the lens as it relates to the ciliary body. But I think mostly it's the hardening of the lens. So I fall back on that as my main theory to presbyopia, so patients can certainly understand that. Next slide. So to ensure success, the whole thing revolves around patient selection and also the creation of the camera patient. Because most likely, the ideal patient, the unicorn, is not going to walk through your door. These patients may have previous LASIK. These patients may have had um, uh, poor uh, results as, as to concerning monovision with a contact lens. Um, we have to really explore a lot of different variabilities when it comes to the creation of the camera patient. We'll talk more and more about that as the, uh, as the lecture moves forward. We're creating camera heroes. Uh, in my office, we have six staff members that have had the camera inlay put in. All six have been extremely successful, and I rely on all six of these camera heroes as a reference point in my office for uh, patients to go back to, to talk to, to understand. Uh, some of these patients are ideal patients. Uh, some, of, some of these employees are patients that have had previous LASIK in the past. So I would highly suggest that you work with some of the employees in your office to create these camera heroes as great clinical references. Next slide. So this was an uh, interesting patient that, or interesting tattoo that presented in the office. Uh, this fellow was walking through with his wife, and his wife was undergoing the camera inlay. And I happened to look down at his leg, and I saw this tattoo on his leg. And I admired that tattoo, and I said, boy, wow, that's a great looking tattoo what, you know, of an eye. Whose eye is that? And he goes, well, that's my wife's eye. And he goes, was anything going to change in regards to that tattoo when she has the inlay done? And then I kind of laughed and I said, yeah, there's going to be a little bit of change there. So if you could give me a Sharpie, I'll, I'll draw the inlay in for you on the tattoo. But anyways, I thought it was kind of a funny story. The ideal patient um, that I'm seeing for inlays it's going to be between the ages of 45 to 60. Uh, the target and optimization, I'd like to see the camera inlay at minus, 75, minus 0.75 for my uh, myopic patients and minus 1 for my hyperopic patients. This is pre-camera. Astigmatism less than half diopter. I look for stability and refraction and thicknesses of 500 microns or greater. Next slide. Preoperative testing is going to be very, very similar to you know, what you've worked with in the past with the LASIK uh, patient. But there's going to be three hallmarks on here that I want you to be attentive to. And the one is going to be in patient history. We've got to be attentive to the ocular and medical history because there are some serious medical contraindications to inlays. And we talk about those will be you know, any uh, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, um, any autoimmune disease. Ocularly, we're looking for a history of any dry eye. Uh, we also, all the same contraindications in regards to having LASIK, strabismus, keratoconus, cataracts, and retinal issues as well. The other thing that we have to be uh, looking at is going to be corneal thickness on topography. That's going to be paramount, and I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll explain that a little bit in the future as we get into this more. The acute target is paramount in working with the, uh, the camera patient. It essentially is the heart and lung 
is a diagnostic and preoperative uh, assessment, as well as a, a excellent guidance uh, for the postoperative uh, care of your patient. Uh, it allows me to look at centration. It allows me to look at and assess dry eye assessment. It also lets me look at opacities as it relates to the lens in regards to the objective scatter index. Next slide, please. So patient selection, we talked uh, a little bit about that earlier. Again, from an ocular standpoint, it's paramount that we address corneal surface disease. And again, it's, I have made uh, uh, some decision, you know, some tough decisions early on that I wasn't aware of in regards to my first 20 camera patients, uh, in regards to some of the medical contraindications. So really be attentive to the rheumatoid and arthritis and autoimmune disease as well, as well as scleroderma. And I'd also be very, very weary of patients with fibromyalgia. Previous monovision is a plus for these patients. Um, certainly I have worked with uh, previous LASIK patients that have undergone uh, the procedure and have monovision and not particularly cared for it due to decreased stereosis, decreased um, distance vision. And, but, you know, with the, the new inlay, uh, it certainly helped out in resolving a lot of these negative aspects associated with monovision LASIK. 2020 is paramount in the uncorrected dominant eye. Next slide, please. Now, what is a, I, I wanted to uh, convey this as a simple, very easy way for us to demonstrate the advantages of the camera uh, versus monovision LASIK. So what I, end, what I do from a um, uh, educate, patient education standpoint is I have the um, patient occlude the dominant eye. I use some type of pinhole occluder, whether it be the uh, single occluder or four opter or uh, multi-fenestrated um, occluder. And I have the patient appreciate the distance vision through that occluder because that simulates what the small aperture camera will do. It uh, will, the patient will appreciate the vision at distance, will appreciate the intermediate vision, as well as appreciate the near vision. Then what I have the patient do to simulate a monovision laser vision correction is I occlude the dominant eye, have them use a plus 150 or whatever is necessary to simulate monovision laser vision correction. I have the patient appreciate their near vision, and I also have the patient appreciate their distance vision. And this is a very simple and elegant way for the patients to get a clear understanding of the advantages of the small aperture inlay. And my, all my staff members, uh, it, uh, my technical staff, understand this. So a lot of times this, this will be done in advance of me um, consulting with the patient. So this can easily be done with ancillary personnel and educate um, your staff on this. Next slide, please. So the camera consultation also involves the, having the patient understand the dynamics of accommodation. The dynamics of accommodation is that it, the accommodation changes from age 43 to 60 incrementally. We all know this. So if we, we end up going and doing a, a LASIK patient for monovision at age 45, making the patient minus one in that eye, in the next five to 10 years, that patient's going to be coming back to your office uh, looking for an enhancement to increase the shelf life of a limited shelf life associated with laser vision correction. So we have to discuss with the patient that monovision has a limited shelf life. And with the small aperture camera inlay, it does, it's age independent. So it has a definite advantage over laser vision correction. So right now we've talked about the fact that the camera inlay will give us better distance and intermediate vision over monovision laser correction. And it also has an age independent aspect of it as well. And I've seen uh, patients from eight to 10 years ago that had the camera inlay in. Um, and she's very, very, she's been very, very successful on the long-term aspect of the camera inlay. 
This is irregardless of any age-related ocular pathologies that may arise. Next slide, please. This is the AccuTarget HD instrument. And again, I, we talked a little bit earlier about the, the big three things that I'm looking for, concentration planning, objective scatter index, tear film assessment. Next slide. And this is going to be what the printouts look like. There's going to be four printouts that are going to uh, come out of this assessment. The first one you see there is going to be the preoperative planning. And this is going to be very, very important for proper inlay placement. The inlay should be placed within, um, within 300 microns of the Purkinje versus the center of the pupil. So if the Purkinje uh, is, is uh, let's say the Purkinje is greater than 300 microns from the center of the pupil, the surgeon is to place it at, halfway, at the halfway between the center of the pupil and the first Purkinje image. This, also, this aids in surgery. This aids in the, also in a post-operative assessment looking for any decentration. The OSI, again, is going to uh, assess. It's also what I found is it's a great assessment post-operatively for corneal edema as well. Uh, I can get a good idea on the um, immediate post-op results that relates to the edema when, uh, the, when we're able to look through the 1.6 millimeter aperture after the inlay is put in. It also is a, a, an excellent barometer for lenticular opacities, as mentioned earlier. The, the, third, the third sheet there indicates what the patient's uh, accommodative uh, range is. And the last and, and one of the most important is going to be the tear analysis. And I've actually applied this not only to camera patients, but to LASIK patients as well. Next slide, please. And I'll tell you how, it, you know, how that's important as well. Here's a pre- and post-operative um, centration. And you can see preoperatively what we're looking at is the Purkinje versus the actual uh, center of the pupil. And the surgeon is to, with the placement of the inlay, is to put it ha uh, at the halfway mark in between for proper centration. When assessing, let's say you don't have a uh, AccuTarget HD in your office and you're working with these patients, uh, another way, uh, a, another simple way to um, look at this as a slit lamp is to create a, a, a small slit lamp beam, occlude the non-surgical eye, and have the patient look straight ahead. And you can retroilluminate the inlay, and this will also give you a simple man's way of assessing centration of the camera inlay. An important aspect, if you do find that the inlay is decentered, um, you know, it's very important to get that back to the surgeon so that um, they, the, the proper surgical methods can be utilized to help recenter that. A decentered uh, inlay will have much more impact on best corrected visual acuity than an inferior uh, decentration. In my uh, clinical experience, we have not had uh, any decentrations in the, in the 140 some eyes that I've worked with. Next slide, please. Now this slide is the dry eye assessment, and this is a tear film assessment, and this evaluates uh, tear film quality. What's nice about this is it's an excellent objective way to assess tear film. Uh, in, re you know, in our past, we, we've relied on you know, tear breakup times, Shermer, tier, Shermer assessments, and this is a fabulous way to get an idea of what tear film looks like as it breaks apart. Uh, what it's doing is measuring 40 quick images over a 20 second, 20 second time frame, and it gives an idea of how the tears break up and what the retinal image and scatter looks like. And so I have this done on the patients preoperatively and postoperatively. So preoperatively, if I find that the patient got a dry eye problem, obviously it's going to be assessed in, 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 various, in various clinical ways, but it also helps me postoperatively as well. I've also applied it to LASIK patients and PRK patients uh, for their dry eye assessment as well, so it's got a lot of clinical applicability. Next slide, please. Objective, sub, objective scatter index. Uh, again, this is a value. And as the value that is used to assess visual quality, as 
the objective scatter index value means there's more scatter of light and poor retinal quality. Uh, the camera inlays, again, requires extremely good optics, and this is a, a, a very nice objective way to get a lenticular assessment. It's basically wave front from the cornea back to the retina. Next slide, please. Tear film, again, dry eye management is key. You have to realize the anatomy and where the inlay is located. It's located at the apex of the cornea. It's a 1.6 millimeter aperture. It's, if that area is compromised, then vision is going to be compromised, and it will affect the results. The camera, the camera inlay, you know, it, it has to, for in order for this to work properly, that the camera inlay really over that over that surface has to be optimized. So with the use of Restasis, Zydra, Punco Plugs, and Omega-3s, we're able to optimize the, the ocular surface. We do use Punco Plugs on all of our um, camera patients. It's a 30-day dissolvable one. We put it in the inferior puncta at the time of surgery. Next slide, please. Other preoperative assessments that are paramount is going to be corneal thickness analysis. And this becomes important for previous LASIK patients and PRK patients that are contemplating having the camera inlay done. In years past, 10 years, you know, people had, you know, surgeons had used, and, and I had worked with uh, the microkeratome. Now, the microkeratome had a predictability of about plus or minus 20 microns when creating a flap. So if a patient comes in that has had a previous microkeratome flap, then ocular OCT, or the latest thing that I've been using for analysis of corneal thickness is the arc scan. Because we're, in order for the safety of the inlay to be placed in 100 microns below the, the older flap, we have to get an image of that in order for the safety net of having the inlay put in. So corneal analysis is, uh, is going to be very, very paramount in previous LASIK patients. Again, if you're working with a previous femtosecond laser, you know, the predictability on that is give or take, I would, I would think, um, five or about five microns. So if you make a, a LASIK lamellar flap at 100 microns, you could expect it to be probably 95 to 105 microns. So the imaging, the imaging of this is not as paramount as a previous microkeratome flap. Next slide, please. This is the ARC scan. And um, this is actually, uh, I'm having an analysis on my right eye. And it's an immersion, uh, immersion analysis. And what I'm doing is I had a previous, I, my previous LASIK was done in 1997. And I have a monovision set up. And I wanted to get a good look at how thick my flap was. Uh, originally, my flap thickness uh, that Dr. Bob Wiley had done was set at 120 microns. And with this, uh, with this arc scan analysis, I'm looking at mine being at about 147 microns. So again, this uh, is an excellent uh, tool for um, preoperative analysis, preoperative pre -operative analysis on uh, previous microkeratome. Uh, patients. Also very nice to look at corneal epithelium, and I also apply it to previous um, inlay patients in looking at the depth in which the inlay can be placed. So I'm able to assess how accurate our femtosecond lasers working for uh, inlay placement. Next slide, please. So let's talk about a case. Here's a case that uh, I'm not going to go into all the variables on ocular scatter. I'm not going to go into the, you know, a lot of the details on topography. I'm not going to go into all that. There's a lot of a lot of clinical minutia that goes into the clinic into the decision making of these cases. But this is just going to show you a very optimal case. And this this case is is rare to come into your office. So this 48 year old male appears to your office. He's frustrated with his near point vision. He had no history of uh, prior cataract surgery, ocular surgery. His medical health is unremarkable. His dominant eye is his right eye. He's got excellent visual acuity at distance. 
2020 left and right eye. His near vision's poor, 2200, right eye, left eye. Refractively, very low, very low RX. In his right eye, spherical equivalent near Plano. His left eye, spherical equivalent, is near minus a half. He's got nice thick corneas, and his topographies look unremarkable. So I educate him on the camera inlay. I go through the details in regards to the surgical procedure so he has a clear understanding of what it's going to feel like in surgery. He understands that suction will be applied to the eye. We're going to create a pocket. The inlay will be put in. It, it takes approximately 10 minutes to, to do the procedure. There will also be punctal plugs put in. Uh, and I also go into the fact that this is going to be a journey. This is not going to be like, hi, welcome to Disney World, LASIK vision day one. And we'll talk about visual recovery in, later as I show you some of my results. Next slide, please. So this is what I consider a unicorn. A unicorn is a patient that's not going to walk, not, is going to walk in the office not needing to be optimized by either PRK or LASIK. And you can see at day one post-op, we're concentrating on the left eye. At his uncorrected distance vision is very good, 2025. His day one uncorrected near vision, 2060. So I reassure him that as time goes by, it will get better. And at one week out, he's now 2020 right eye and near point in 2020 left eye. So this gentleman recovered quickly. If you look at his refraction at one month post op, it's almost identical to his, what his pre op was. And this would be a normal finding on refraction because the camera inlay is neutral refractively. So we would expect to be have, to have comparable results on the post-operative refraction. We'll talk a little bit about refracting. When it comes to refracting these patients, I use the red-green green method. Uh, and you're also going to find that auto-refraction is unreliable. This is the ideal patient, the unicorn. Next slide, please. So what do we do in our practice when the ideal unicorn does not appear to you? It's very unlikely that they'll, they'll just walk in like this. The emetropes don't just appear. So again, important clinical considerations are going to be corneal thickness assessment, understanding the safety net in regards to where the previous lamellar LASIK flap was in regards to the placement, and understanding that you have proper thickness in order to put the inlay in. Postoperative refraction target for the camera patient that may be undergoing late, previous LASIK. I like to target the patient to be minus 75 in the myopic patient and minus one sphere in the hyperopic patient. This is due to healing regression associated with, with each. Timing consideration. At this timing consideration, when we were working on our first um, several cases, we would stage our, stage our camera cases. We would have the patient undergo the LASIK procedure, and in 30 days or longer, if their optimization or target refraction was met, then we could undergo the camera inlay. I found in, in higher prescriptions, higher miles, higher hypropes, it may take a bit longer for optimization to occur. And I've also had a, few, a couple of cases where we've actually had to go back and enhance uh, patients from a LASIK standpoint after their original LASIK to achieve optimization. So, you know, my take-home message in regards to you know, the early camera cases is that staging is a very, very important part of the understanding of healing trends, and also hyperops, hyperops may take a little, little bit longer. Understanding your surgical plan. Uh, next slide, please. This is, the next slide shows what's going to be very important for our surgeon to understand the depth, hinge, hinge position, marking the eye, and understanding the laser. This is going to be more interoperative for our surgical planning. Next slide, please. So there are five different decision-making processes when you're working with your camera patient. You work with the emetropes in the primary case. We talked a lot about staging. There's also previous LASIK patients and understanding the importance of corneal depth and a safety net. And then we're also working now with same-day LASIK and camera patients. And I've also worked with previous patients or patients that we've done PRK in simultaneous camera, and I've worked with also some camera patients that are pseudophagic monofocal patients. Next slide, please. 
Each of these requires a lot of decision making. So the heart and lung, from my early clinical experiences, is going to be the AccuTarget HD. Centration is key. Understanding that ocular uh, surface is key. Understanding post-operative drop, understanding expectations is key. So there's a whole new paradigm shift in, in educating yourself in regards to patient selection. Actually, post-operative management, I found, is, is actually probably the hardest nuance associated uh, with this procedure. Next slide, please. Myopia, when you're dealing with myopic patients, these patients see great without correction. Hypopic patients see poorly with either with, with, with their uncorrected vision and distance vision. So expectations have to be conveyed with these patients preoperatively. So there's a greater higher, higher satisfaction with hyperopic patients undergoing this than myopic patients. Next slide, please. This is a breakdown of our results. Again, at this point, when I put this together, we had 127 eyes. The, this is the, the majority, the, the bubbles are kind of weird here, but it's, uh, the 72 is male and the 55 is female. We had one explant in our, in our 127 eyes. Next slide, please. This gives us a breakdown as to the surgery types that I've worked with, emetropes, recent LASIK, previous LASIK, same day, previous PRK, pseudofakes, and PRK on top of camera. But, excuse me, PRK on top of camera. Next slide, please. Here's our outcomes. Outcomes are going to be important in regards to following these patients. I'm intrinsic in regards to gathering these outcomes. I look at, uh, I look at the importance of it in regards to whenever you um, take outcomes. It's important to set your near point rod at 16 inches, have proper illumination. Everything has to be the same. The key is, if you look at day one, these patients are 10% are 20-20 at near. At day one distance, 24%. But look at the six month and the three month. This is where your wow factor will come at the 90 day to 120 day. So when you're talking to these patients, have an understanding. It's a journey to get to that three month to six month level. This includes all hyperopes, myopes, and astigmats. Next slide, please. And this is going to be our 2020, 2025 level. Next slide, please. And this next slide will show our 2040 level at six months out. 43, 43 eyes, 90%, 20, 20, 40 or better at near and at distance, 20, 97% at six months post out. Next slide, please. So we'll talk a little bit about case discussion here. Okay. So Brenda, if, if this I'm presenting this to you, if you could give me some insight as to you know what you're thinking, you know, is this patient actually a good candidate for camera? Or should you wait? Or what's your feelings? That is a great question. And on paper, she looks like a perfect candidate. You know, we're looking for somebody in the right age range that's um, fairly emetropic and um, has good distance acuity but decreased near acuity. Um, she is a nurse, it says. And the thing that stands out the most for me is that it says she's starting to use reading glasses for fine print. So keeping in mind that this woman is only 43 years old, um, her reading glasses to her at this point are an annoyance rather than a something she can't function without. So really for her, your discussion is going to be important. Um, you want to make sure that you've set your expectation for this particular patient. She is not dependent on her readers, which tells you she still has some accommodation left. Um, the other thing that I noticed, too, is that her cycloplegic refraction is plus one in each eye. So at 43 years old, with a cyclo of plus one, she's probably a latent hyperope. So that's going to be of importance as well if you were to implant this patient, because the amount of um, vision that she needs at this point at 43 is going to be different as she gets older, as her hyperopia progresses, and as her need for reading glasses progresses as well. So really, um, you want to just kind of educate this patient and make sure that she understands all issues. This would probably be a longer conversation, in my opinion, than somebody who's well into their 50s. Um, she is female, 
So you want to make sure you do a complete dry eye assessment using the ACU targets and looking at that OSI. She likely doesn't have any issues if she's not complaining of any at this age, but you never know. So really, yes, for so her, I, I think um, education, expectation management. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're exactly right. You know, we talk, I talked a little bit earlier about planting the seed. I think the most important uh, point in this uh, review would be plant the seed. Um, keep this patient uh, close to your clinic as far as, uh, you know, seeing her back the next year because you're going to see the accommodative uh, status change and looking for more dependency uh, for, for the reading vision uh, as, in regards to optical usage. Uh, she's, again, just starting at this point and may not necessarily uh, rely on the reader. So keeping this patient close, planning to see. Key. Next slide, please. So this changes now, Brenda. Now we're, we're yes. going to add a decade to this, this female. So this may change your thought processes. So let's, uh, let's get an opinion on this. Yeah, definitely. I think that this is a uh, patient that's going to be more suited to really discuss the surgical options with her. You know, she's got 10 more years uh, under her belt, so to speak. She, her um, ocular, her parameters are the same as the previous patient. But she's now dependent on reading glasses. She has to use them um, daily for things that she needs. Um, her accommodative system is not very useful to her. Um, but also, since she is a little bit older, you'll want to be sure and check for dry eye issues. Does she have any ocular surface disease? And anyone over 50, you'll want to start looking for other pathology as well. Doubted, doubt that she has a cataract because her acuity is so good, but that's also something that you want to look for as well. Um, and so with this patient, you really um, want to optimize uh, her outcome with the camera. So. She's fairly emetrophic, but she's somebody that would really benefit from being made a little bit myopic in her left eye, which would be her camera implanted eye. Um, that would really help her out with her near vision, and as she ages and she becomes more of an absolute presbyope, that's going to be beneficial to her as well. So I think this is the ideal patient for uh, implanting the camera. I think that her expectations are going to be set just by nature of what she does currently. She uses her glasses constantly, um, and I think she's going to do very well with this type of procedure, pr providing you can um, make her understand the issues. And the other, the only other comment I thought about in regards to this is I have to look back at, you know, the 50-some uh, female patients that I worked with. The average age was 52 uh, that I was working with, and out of that percentage of females preoperatively, I started uh, all those patients on cyclosporin. Um, mm -hmm. Because of the, you know, the hormone issue, the affiliation with dry eye in that patient, particular patient population, I think that um, we have, a, we can either go with cyclosporin or, or Zydra as a preoperative uh, preventive for dry eye. Sure. Next slide, please. Now this one, Let's take a look at this one. Uh, again, 53-year-old female, a preoperative higher manifest refraction on the hyperoptic side, uh, uncorrected visual acuity, uh, 2063, 20, best corrected acuity, which is nice to see, 2020. Now, what's, what is your uh, thoughts in regards to this female, if, in regards to the previous female with the different refractive error? Yeah, this, this patient is going to need um, LASIK or PRK to correct her distance prescription because she's dependent on glasses for both distance and for near. So she is going to be someone that needs a bilateral treatment, um, bilateral LASIK, not only to get the distance eye seeing well far away, but you also want to make the camera eye a little bi bit myopic to really optimize her outcome. So she's going to either need a staged procedure or perhaps a same-day procedure, depending on what your surgeon prefers. Um, also, of course, like you just mentioned, she's the same age as the previous patient, so cyclosporin preoperatively is going to be a benefit to her. Um, but she, she, you know, she's clearly going to get benefits from doing this procedure because she's very dependent on glasses, both distance and for near. So she'll be happy if everything goes well. 
Right. Um, whenever you let me ask you a question about uh, whenever you clinically go and check for dominance of eye, what you know? Can you give us some clinical pearls as to how you go about doing it? And I, I have a you know that you know you can have your hands held out looking through a small mm -hmm. small piece. What what's your way of assessing that clinically? That's typically what we had done in the past. We established the dominant eye with the old, um, you know, find a spot in the wall, hold your hands up, put, you know, both yeah. eyes open, spot between that little area, and then you check. A lot of times I would ask the patient um, which eye they, you know, before we had digital cameras, which eye they would sight with through a camera, um, or just ask the patient, because a lot of patients already know which is their dominant eye. Right. And also, you know, if the patient does come in, uh, with previous monovision contact lenses, obviously that's a pretty good indication of what their what their neurological adaptations have been to dominant eye versus non-dominant eye. Absolutely, definitely. Has pupil size been a, an issue in regards to any previous uh, late, any previous camera patients that you've worked with in the past? I would say yes. In the clinical trial, we had to, I forget what the parameters were, but the, the people had to fall within a certain range or they were excluded. And the reason for that was um, glare and halo issues at night. If the patient came in, I can remember one patient that had like eight plus millimeter pupils in mesopic lighting. And she had good acuity postoperatively, but she really had some um, extra photopsias there that were not optimal for the situation. Um, conversely, we had a patient who had very, very small pupils, and the camera works very well in that situation, but what you have to counsel the patient about is the cosmesis issue, because if you put a 3.8 millimeter dark disc in front of a very small pupil, it makes that pupil look artificially larger. So when that patient is when you look at that patient, she's going to look like they've got one a pupil that's larger than the other. So, Correct. you know, different scenarios for large pupils versus small pupils. Um, I would say the larger pupil is probably the larger issue because it really has the more of a visual effect. On the okay. Outcome. All right. Excellent. What have you found? Well, you know, in that patient population, the pupil size is the obviously is the patient ages. The pupil size diminishes, correct? And yeah. uh, in that in, in that patient in that patient population, again, in my average age, the patient's 52 years old. So pupil size really, I haven't had any aberrant pupil sizes that I've attributed in in, in the cases that I've managed to be uh, a significant factor in causing aberrations at nighttime. But it's always it's always one of those things in the back of my mind that I'm that I'm that I'm thinking about, you know. And I also, sure. I'm also looking at whether it be a hyperopic ablation pre-op or a myopic ablation pre-op and the amount that's affiliated with that type of ablation, because certainly that goes in conjunction with aberrations at night based on, based on the uh, preoperative refractive error. Absolutely. That's definitely a consideration also. Great job. Thank you very much, Jeff and Brenda. We really appreciate it. Um, we do have a few questions from the participants, so we'd like to take this time now and discuss some of their great questions that they sent in. As time allows, we've got about, about eight or nine minutes to answer a few of those questions, so I'll pose them to you um, individually, if you don't mind. So one of, one of the questions we got from the participants is, um, and I'll, I'll um, give this to you, Brenda, how do you measure the white to white? in your clinic? The white to white we would measure with the use of the um, eye well master. Or um, sometimes you can just look at it. Um, we used to have calipers that we used for ICL and, you know, Verisize when that first came out. Um, but really the white to white I don't find to be a huge consideration when you're looking at patient selection. Um, but we used the, the biometry from the eye well master when we did look at it. Great, right, thank you. Jeff, anything different? Yeah, when, whenever we look, we're looking at white to white, I think our topographer, which is the Zeiss topographer, actually the Atlas analyzes white to white, so I'm able to look at that as a, um, if I need to look at that. But to me, it, it hasn't been a real uh, big surgical parameter in regards to um, planning um, the inlay impl implantation. 
Great, thank you. Um, we have a few more questions. So if a patient, if uh, the question is, if my patient is a contact lens wearer, should we follow typical protocols of discontinuing contact lens use and repeating pre-op tests looking for stability? Brenda, you can address that then. Sure. Um, I, I would always advise my patients, just as you would for any refractive surgical case, that you want to have a stable set of measurements prior to making any surgical planning, regardless if that's camera, if that's LASIK. You've got to know what you're dealing with before you start changing things. And so, yes, for gas permeable lenses, you know, we always had the patient leave them out for at least a month plus additional weeks, depending on how long they had been wears. Um, and really what you're looking for is stability. So rather than give them a, a week time frame, I would just bring them back and, and check them periodically to make sure that we obtained a stable um, cornea prior to making any planning or any decisions regarding the surgery. I, I have to concur with that as far as um, being out of the, the contact lenses. Um, I generally have the patients out uh, two weeks prior to doing a preoperative analysis. Uh, my protocol for rigid gas permeables is usually one month uh, per decade of wear. Uh, so if a patient has 30, 30 years wear of rigid gas perms, I um, will have them uh, take the contact lenses out for 90 days uh, and do a serial topography to look for any type of uh, changes as, as that uh, cornea goes back to its normal physiology. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we have another question about um, the camera inlay and the success with pseudofakes. Can you um, uh, share anything on that, Brenda? Absolutely. You know, we, like you mentioned, I've been working with the camera since 2006. And naturally, back in the clinical trial, we enrolled, um, I think the age range was 45 to 60. So here we are 10 years later. Naturally, cataracts are going to develop in that time. Um, and we've done, in our practice, I believe we did, I'm going to say about four or five patients that had been prior camera patients, developed cataracts, um, and they've done beautifully. The surgeon is able to perform the surgery um, very easily through the scope. He, he didn't find the inlay to be a hindrance at all from a visual perspective. Um, and we implanted monofocal implants in these patients. And the beauty of this is that the patient still gets the benefits of the camera, um, but even now that they're pseudophagic, they're still able to enjoy that good near vision that they had before. So really, this is a technology that's applicable across, you know, the whole spectrum of phagic patients, pseudophagic patients. Really, presbyopia is about the only criteria you need to make this technology work. Great. Jeff, do you have any um, additions to that? Yeah, I think what, you know, with AccuFocus, uh, you know, with their European front now that they, they have work, they're working with the IC8, and that's a uh, IOL that has the inlay on it, and uh, certainly over in the European front uh, with their launch, I've heard great success with that. I have worked with uh, two, um, uh, two pseudophagic patients. One's pretty interesting because he had undergone LASIK with me 10 years ago, uh, developed a cataract five years ago. We ended up removing the cataract and obviously became an absolute uh, presbyope with the removal of the lens. He was frustrated by that, and I offered him the uh, possibility of putting a, a camera inlay in and uh, underwent the camera inlay, and he's completely satisfied. So this patient underwent previous LASIK, under, has undergone previous cataract surgery, and now the third tier, and ventured into the new technology of the camera inlay with great success. Super, thank you. Uh, we have time only for one more question. And this question is, um, if a patient doesn't show a strong dominance in either eye, which eye do you choose? Jeff, you want to take that one first? Yeah, I've had this happen to me a few times in regards to uh, decision-making regarding dominance. And a lot of times what I'll end up doing is I, I'll figure out what the, the, the manifest refraction is, and I'll have the patient uh, do a contact lens trial, uh, trying out monovision uh, ahead of time, trying out, let's say, the, you want to try the right eye first and the left eye second, and play around with that as, as to a neuroadaptation 
at the figure out which eye is the, the dominant eye. So I think a contact lens trial uh, is probably your best bet in, in isolation in the comfortability of the eye in regards to undertaking the, the inlay. Brenda, anything different on that one? No, I agree completely with Jeff. Um, I think, you know, in that situation, just letting the patient try the two different scenarios and see which one they like the best, understanding that it's not a perfect simulation of, of camera vision, but it, it'll definitely give you a um, kind of a, a head in the right direction. Great. Thank you very much. Well, that's all the time we really have today. Thank you very much for all your questions, and thank you for joining us for the first in the clinical webinar series. We hope you found it valuable. And don't forget to join us for the next clinical webinar on Tuesday, November 8th. So stay tuned to your email for the next announcement and the link to view today's webinar. Good day, everyone.